were an angst-riddled teenager between, like, 2003 and 2012, I don't think you ever really grow out of being an emo kid. I still have a collection of albums lined up that immediately transport me to the floor of my childhood bedroom, where I'm staring at the ceiling, silently brooding, perhaps with a single tear running down my cheek. And my dad is barging through my bedroom door, ignoring this obvious main character moment to tell me that dinner's ready. And look, a lot of people have a similar nostalgic relationship with music from their teen years. That's part of the joy of it. But I do think there was something special about emo. If you liked emo, you needed emo, you know? Remember just that smidge of moral panic about men in eyeliner and girls' jeans? I bloody love a bit of moral panic especially one so sexy. Which is why it brings me great joy to say that after the failures of the pandemic, I will, in 2022, achieve what I was supposed to achieve in 2020. An achievement no smaller than seeing My Chemical Romance on my 30th birthday. It will still be my 30th birthday, because I am refusing to acknowledge the two full years that have passed between having the prospect of being wine drunk screaming I'm not okay cruelly ripped away from me by the novel coronavirus and actually being wine drunk screaming I'm not okay at the top of my lungs with a bunch of other aging emo kids. I'm going to be standing up at a stadium show for the first time in about seven years and I'm going to complain about my back hurting probably the whole time and at least two days afterwards, but it's happening, baby. I've gotten my chemical romance tickets. But I don't want to jinx it. So I've decided to channel my energy into digging through the soundtrack to my teen angst. I'm Alex, this is Pop Culture Boner, the podcast edition, and today I'm thinking about emo music. One of the things that I don't think I realized about emo before I started writing this episode was that people seem to be really ornery about what music is actually emo and whether or not their band kind of counts as emo. I think part of this has to do with the fact that emo as a term was coined in the late 80s hardcore scene where bands with kind of a more personal or sensitive bent to their lyrics were referred to as emo core, usually in a way that was derogatory. Now, I know it's a huge shock for everyone involved to discover that the angry, angry boys of the late 80s hardcore scene were mad when someone made up a whole portmanteau to describe them having feelings in their songs, but here we are. That kind of derogatory connotation has hung around basically forever, and even bands that kind of define the post-2000 era I'm referring to when I talk about emo and who are most people's first thought when they hear the word, spent a lot of time shit-talking the concept and trying to disassociate themselves from the label. So I think it's probably worthwhile for me to clarify which brand of emo I'm going to actually be talking about throughout this episode. While I appreciate emo's roots, I love Rites of Spring, I love Sunny Day Real Estate, I specifically want to talk about what music journalists call third-wave emo. It's like third wave feminism, only much, much worse. Post millennium, riddled with eyeliner, box hair dye, really long fringes, skinny jeans. That, for me, is the sweet spot of teen angst. In terms of bands, there's the kind of holy trinity of emo who are the mainstream face of things My Chemical Romance, Fallout Boy, Panic at the Disco. And then there are things that are kind of orbital to that. So AFI, The Used, Thursday, Brand New, Jimmy Eat World, Bring Me the Horizon. These bands are actually pulling from a lot of places sound-wise. Some are screamo, some are more pop punk. But they do tend to get lumped together under similar headings. And if there's one thing we should know about BMI now, it's that I don't know shit about music. (laughs) I am simply using my internal sad boy navigation system Anytime it pings, I tap the emo sign, and you can't stop me. With all that being said, I recently revisited some emo playlists to spend some time in my feelings, and Taking Back Sunday's Make Damn Sure came on. In case you don't remember, here is a lyrical sample of Make Damn Sure. I'm gonna make damn sure that you can't ever leave. You won't ever get too far from me. 
I just want to break you down so badly in the worst way. And this vision of love presented by an emo band where two people destroy each other by sheer proximity and intensity of feeling got me thinking about the amount of psychic damage I've dealt myself as a teenage girl listening to these allegedly sensitive boys sing about crushing the life out of me. So I want to take a look at the heart and soul of emo. Why'd it happen? Were these waifish men and eyeliner having some sort of crisis of masculinity? Destroying the patriarchy? Were they really kissing each other? Or were they being rampantly misogynistic and getting away with it under the guise of being sensitive? Will I end up destroying my own love of men in nail polish? Would Gerard Way ever hurt me? The answer to the last one is no, and I won't be interrogating it any further, but everything else is fair game. Let's get into it. There's actually a lot of academic writing on emo, uh, possibly because every sad girl who loved a sad boy grew up to get a PhD in an attempt to unpack their misguided feelings. Hello, Grace Sharkey, friend of the podcast. But more likely, uh, it's because there was an explosion of popularity in the early 2000s that resulted in a wave of really alarmist newspaper articles decrying emo as a cult. The Daily Mail, ever the reliable source, published an article in 2006 called Emo Cult Warning for Parents, and another in 2008 called Why No Child is Safe from the Sinister Cult of Emo. The article refers to the Black Parade as a place where emos believe they go when they die, as opposed to just a title of a My Chemical Romance album. Um, And at one point it implies that emo can't be the same as the teenage rebellion that punks had in the 70s and 80s, because punks at least had a zest for life. Ah yes, who could forget the famously zest-filled lyrics of people starving to death under Thatcher? There's no future in England's dreaming. Anyway, this panic was centred around a couple of key concerns. Concerns for young women, that they would become so overwhelmed by the sadness contained in the lyrics that they would slip into a self-destructive depression, as embodied by their wearing all black and lashings of eyeliner. And concern for young men, that the emotive nature of the lyricism would soften them so that they too were infected with this overwhelming sadness as embodied by their wearing of all black and lashings of eyeliner. Or should I say guyliner, since we're quoting 2008. It's almost like no one writing these articles had ever met a hormone-addled teenager before. What I think is interesting about both of these perspectives on emo is that they're really concerned with reinforcing the gender binary through the policing of feelings and emotional expression, and the way those things manifest in music and clothing. Basically, conservative media outlets thought that girls would get more hysterical and then the boys would suddenly become hysterical as opposed to stoic and calm like they would normally be. And if all the men are all upset, then who's going to keep the women in check? But actually, they needn't have worried. Masculinity was doing just fine under emo. It was just wearing tighter jeans than normal. While I was writing this episode, I read a book by uh, Judith May Fattler called Emo, How Fans Defined a Subculture. And in it, she uses the argument that rock music, regardless of what form it's taking, provides us with a framework for acceptable heterosexual expression. Not that it's impossible to change, but rather because it interacts with the culture that produces it, and because that culture hasn't made any significant changes to the value that it places on those structures, what we're getting is a consistent replication of socially acceptable heterosexuality. Contained within that is a preference for and a privilege of masculinity, even if the masculinity being represented is not that kind of jockey archetype that is supposed to represent all men. So even when a subculture like emo emerges from this scene, it's more likely to replicate those types of patterns that were already prevalent, even if it's a shift in aesthetic, sound, and presentation. Because these structures still preference masculinist ideals, even when they're dressed up differently, when subcultures emerge within music, they tend to create an alternative space for masculinity to develop rather than a space that is necessarily sort of challenging or rebellious. There are two really good examples of this. Um, The first can be found in the hardcore scene that emo sprung up from. 
Hardcore was an aggressive reaction to Reagan-era conservatism. It was angry, political, and it claimed egalitarianism. Now, I say claimed because that's demonstrably not the case. (laughs) There were very few women visible in bands popular on the scene at the time. And even though you know there are women there, because there always are, you rarely see them in the crowd because the performative violence of moshing is a ritual that's almost exclusively reserved for men. When the documentary camera pans, it's inevitably following writhing, shirtless, very white male bodies. It's a homosocial bonding activity, and to quote Fatala, the euphoria depends on the absence of women. The second example is the absence of women in emo's renaissance in the early 2000s. But Alex, I hear you cry, there are women in emo's big wave. Paramore exists. Hayley Williams is right there. And you're right. I would never want to discredit Paramore and Hayley Williams or any of the other women who were in smaller bands writing their angsty hearts out. But it's telling that Paramore's biggest hit and their breakout song was Misery Business, where the entire lyrical premise is being not like other girls. It includes such lyrical hits as Once a whore, you're nothing more. I'm sorry, that'll never change. Uh, And there's a million other girls who look just like you, looking as innocent as possible just to get to who they want and what they want. It's easy if you do it right. Well, I refuse. It's a sign of changes in the times, perhaps, that Hayley Williams has since made multiple statements about Misery Business's status as a fan favourite. In 2015, she said, I haven't related to it in a very long time. Those words were written when I was 17 and admittedly from a very narrow-minded perspective. And then again in 2020, following the addition of one of the band's newer songs to a Women in Rock playlist on Spotify, I know it's one of the band's biggest songs, but it shouldn't be used to promote anything having to do with female empowerment or solidarity. I'm so proud of Paramore's career. It's not about shame. It's about growth and progression. And though it'll always be a fan favorite, we don't need to include it on playlists in 2020. Essentially, even though Misery Business is an undeniable banger of a song, at least part of the reason for its success and the reason Paramore was so acceptable in an otherwise overwhelmingly male scene was that Hayley Williams was able to adopt the same masculinist postures of her counterparts. Scene queens are a really common motif in emo lyricism. Girls who aren't there for the music, man, they're just sluts looking to break hearts and seem cool next to the band. And Misery Business basically gives us a woman's perspective on that, while also showing how well she can fit in. Which brings me back to the big question. Exactly how much psychic damage did I deal myself by listening to this stuff almost exclusively from 2004 to 2009? I'm a pretty sad little guy anyway, and I was definitely a sad teenager, so I think it's probably telling that all of my favourites from this era are really just extremely theatrical bouts of depression. Uh, AFI's Sing the Sorrow from 2003 and December Underground from 2006 were on high rotation for me at all times, and I sort of tentatively looked back at them recently to see if there were any glaring layers of misogyny that I missed the first time around because I was too bedazzled by Davey Havoc's frosty shadow and false lashes in the Miss Murder video. Miss Havoc giving us everything, giving us face, giving us body. I'm pleased to report it mostly seems to be a lot of metaphor about being in love with death or being loved by death or being reincarnated only to die again slowly, or becoming death. (laughs) All of which are the kinds of dramatic bullshit my little gremlin brain thrives on. Having my body picked apart by a raven only to return as a raven? Yes, please. But what if I was a girl who was into love songs? What then? Well, nothing good, probably. (laughs) The explosion of emo into popularity was driven by women, even as the scenes surrounding it catered almost exclusively to men. Teenage girls, once again, deserve all the credit. And the boys in the band were being sold to those same girls as soft. It's in the name. They were emotional and in touch with their femininity. They weren't afraid to wear eyeliner, borrow your jeans and kiss in the rain or whatever. 
Without trying to be overly reductive, girls in their early teen years love this kind of non-threatening boy because the promise of him is that he's not going to disrespect you or be different around his friends or dump you on your birthday. He can't hurt you. Except that behind the softened image, lots of the bands were peddling the same sort of virgin whore dichotomy dressed up in a new hat. In her 2015 essay, Where the Girls Aren't, uh, Jessica Hopper says, There was a time when emo seemed reasonable, encouraging, exciting, revivifying in its earnestness and personal stakes. These new bands modelled themselves on bands we all liked, Jawbox, Jawbreaker, Sunny Day Real Estate. The difference was, in those bands' songs about women, the girls had names, details to their lives. Girls in emo songs today do not have names. We are not identified beyond our absence, our shape drawn by the pain we've caused. Our lives, our day-to-day-to-day, does not exist. We do not get coloured in. Our actions are portrayed solely through the detailing of neurotic self-entanglement of the boy singer. Our region of personal power, simply, is our impact on his romantic life. We're vessels redeemed in the light of boy love. On a pedestal on our backs, muses at best, cum rags or invisible at worst. Now, emotional pain in love songs is not anything new. In fact, one of the overwhelming thematic elements of Western pop music is love as intense, suffocating, emotionally and physically painful. In order for love to be satisfying, it has to drain you out. Natasha Mulvihill flags this as a way of normalising coercive control through pop music, but she does this largely by using female singers. I think it's interesting to think about where this positions you as a girl listening to an allegedly sensitive and different emo boy sing about the pain he's being subjected to by a girl. It puts young female listeners in an impossible position. You lean into the gender roles in the song and position yourself as the girl and you're that bitch that's responsible for all his pain. And you definitely don't want to be that, so you side with the singer you're so emotionally attached to. On some level, you might be applying it to whatever teen heartbreak you're experiencing that week, but on another deeper level, you're probably also vowing that you would never be that girl to him. You wouldn't do something so terrible. He's so sad and he needs you so badly. You'd never leave him like that. I know this sounds like a big leap, but I don't think it's unreasonable, especially given the amount of men in the emo scene whose reputations preceded them and who were eventually exposed as emotionally abusive, manipulative sex pests. Brand News frontman Jesse Lacey was accused of, and confessed to, serial sexual misconduct with female fans, many of whom were underage at the time. He blamed a dependent relationship with sex as the cause. And he's one of many that I can think of off the top of my head. Any cursory Google search will find you a myriad of posts from girls warning their friends in the scene on who to avoid. I think it's pretty telling that the moral panic around emo had more to do with a softening of boys, when in reality the softening just provided them with a mask to use when they were talking to women. Another article on emo by uh, Sam Du Bois called this feigned sympathy with feminist anger in order to pull, labelling the behaviour beta male misogyny. So with all that in mind, uh, what about the question that I said I wouldn't answer? Would my boy Gerard Way ever hurt me? And if he would, was there ever really any value in emo at all? I think the answer to this question ultimately comes down to what you took out of it. Like I said, for me, watching the theatricality and camp of Gerard in My Chemical Romance and Davey in AFI gave me names for all of my big teenage feelings. Screaming the lyrics to the Leaving Song Part 2 or Helena meant that the dark bits weren't scary, they just were, and they were surmountable. And while they might have tricked me into thinking that every man with like a smidge of eyeliner and a fancy haircut was incredibly sexy, they didn't ruin me forever. They gave me space. I needed emo, and emo was for me. Well, uh, those were my big old feelings on emo. Um, I rewatched a lot of video clips from emo bands for this, and can I just say, 
Miss Davy Havoc's beauty from Sing the Sorrow to December Underground might have actually made me gay. <laughs> like, watch the video for the leaving song part two as he unties his hair and lets it tumble across his shoulders. And tell me that's not stirring something in you. Uh, if you have big feelings about emo circa 2006, please talk to me about them next time you see me at the pub. Peace. Peace.